Let us pray and ask for God's blessing before we listen to his holy word. Father, we turn now to your word, infallible, inerrant, and given to us by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We trust that the same Spirit who inspired these words will illuminate us this morning to see the beauty of Christ, the one who was sent by you to be our Messiah and Savior. And for the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the living God shall stand forever and ever. So open our eyes to behold wonderful things through your holy word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now we come to uh, chapter 6, verses 22 to 35. It's the longest chapter in John's Gospel, and it's the longest chapter in the entire New Testament. So we have lots of uh, lessons here, and so we go slowly. And today we come to verses 22 to 35. The crowds are seeking Jesus. That's a good sign that mm-hmm. someone's seeking Jesus. But what is more important behind seeking Jesus is what is the motivation? Why do you seek Jesus? And that's the thrust of what John is trying to uh, let us know, know and see from here. Because we are very slow learners. If Jesus can feed 5,000 men, he can cross the water, he can disappear and appear in another place. It's easy for him. But because we are dull in our understanding, and we are very veiled and blinded in our spiritual eyes, we say, wow, you can feed 20,000 people. And then next day we will say, what happened? How did you come here? How did you do that? Oh, you are sent by God? Show us another miracle. So we are like that. This is the one of the characteristics of the crowd. No matter how long you've been trusting Jesus, if you are one of the crowd, you will always ask God for a sign. It's just like one of the scholars said, what God blessed us 10 minutes ago, we will take it as something that happened 10 years ago. You're very forgetful. We are cold-hearted. The crowds are well aware that something very strange has happened. Jesus is no longer present at the scene of the feeding. But he didn't leave in one of the boats that had been present. So that's verse 22. Next day, the crowd that has stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that Only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Something strange happened. While the crowd did not witness Jesus walking on the water during the night, they come to realize that the feeding miracle was not the only unusual thing that had taken place. So they set out for Capernaum to seek Jesus on the other side. That's verse 24. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and went to Capernaum in search for Jesus. For they may have heard that the disciples took that direction. If you look at verse 17, for example, it says, where they were going, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark. So they heard that the disciples were heading that way, and Capernaum was the new headquarters for Jesus' ministry. If you look up Matthew 4, in verse 13, it says, Leaving Nazareth, Jesus went and lived in Capernaum 
which was by the lake. So Capernaum was where Jesus stayed by this time. Mark 9 again, they came to Capernaum where he was in the house. Uh, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? So Mark also says that Jesus was staying in Capernaum. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, at least four of them, <clears throat> fishermen, also lived there. It was their hometown, Capernaum and Bethsaida. And many people sought and searched for Jesus. Like these crowds and Nicodemus who came to search and seek for Jesus in chapter 3, they failed to trust and obey Jesus' teachings. You seek Jesus, but you fail to obey his teachings. Strange, isn't it? The crowds are only interested in seeing miraculous signs, but have no desire to trust and obey his teachings. Jesus must be worshipped and regarded as God and God's Messiah, but they're not following Jesus' teachings. So Jesus no longer wants to um, give them uh, parables. Jesus wants to speak to them directly now. I am the bread of life. They still don't get it. We are very slow learners. I am the bread of life that gives you eternal life. Because without bread, without food, we cannot survive. So unlike human beings, Jesus is able to see what is in our hearts. We've been uh, learning that each chapter. So Jesus knows what is in the crowd's heart. Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 25, they ask him. Finally, they found him and asked him. They want to know what happened. What sort of miraculous signs have you done while we were sleeping? They call him rabbi, teacher, but they don't, again, follow his teachings. It's a conditional trust. It's a conditional clinging. It's conditional obedience. Like other times, Jesus doesn't answer people's question directly. When did you get here? The desired answer would be, I got here at such time by such means. But Jesus answers by accusing their wrong motives and their attitude. That's verse 25. And 26, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miracles or signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your uh, fill. So Jesus knows everything. If you really saw my miraculous sign, which is pointing everything to me, that's the purpose of miraculous sign, isn't it? If you really saw miraculous sign and realize that feeding of the 5,000 pointed to me as the bread of life and the giver of eternal life, you wouldn't be here. But you are here because you now have breakfast time or lunch time again and you need your food again. And that's the characteristic of physical food, isn't it? How nice or how expensive the food may be, it won't last long. You will need another feed. So Jesus says that I want to test your heart. Just like I tested Nicodemus' heart and I tested Samaritan woman's heart, I tested the paralyzed man for 30 years' heart, I want to test your heart. Why are you seeking me? Why are you searching for me? You want to have another feat today? Because the true purpose of the sign 
is to reveal Jesus' identity and his ministry of salvation. The true meaning of feeding of the 5,000 was for you to ask this question. If he can feed 20,000 people, who is he? But they only understood Jesus as the means to achieve their ends. Jesus was seen as a means to the filling of their stomachs. Jesus did not come to fill our stomachs with food, but to fill our lives with the very presence of God and salvation, which is only possible through him. The crowd is focusing on the physical realm, just like us. So think about your last past week. Were you focusing yourself on the physical realm? Or were you interested and seeking for the spiritual realm? For John, the physical and the spiritual realms are interconnected. One of the problems that we have is that the dichotomy and division that we create between physical and spiritual. But John is constantly reminding us the physical and spiritual are interconnected. Too often we fail to have eyes to see and ears to hear the God who is present in our lives in everyday ordinary life through the physical realms. We work hard for our daily bread, and we find the miraculous source of food, provision of daily bread, that's the miraculous provision of God. So we are happy, but we stop there. We fail to go to spiritual realm by saying that, thank you, God, for providing our daily bread. It's not my doing, but it's your provision. That's what Israel people failed to do in the desert. Not just four months or four years, but 40 years, they were fed by God. It's not the food from the earth. It's the food from heaven. Every day, they have feed from heaven, which is manna. But they fail to go to the spiritual realm and say, Father, thank you for providing us our daily bread. Because this is wilderness. This is desert. We have nowhere to find something to eat. Unless you provide us this manna, we cannot survive. You are our sustainer and provider. So Jesus says in verse 27, Do not work for food that spoils. What I fed you yesterday, what I fed you yesterday, that was wonderful, but it spoils. It doesn't last long. But for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Surely we need to work hard for living, but what is our deeper vocation? Our focus should not be on physical food alone, which is temporal. As we've been saying, physical daily food itself is a great miracle of God's provision. But, like manna in the wilderness, it does not last long. And the life it nourishes is all too brief. Our physical lives of flesh and blood are given by God, and they are important, but they are not the whole story. The problem that the crowd is lingering on is about physical provision of the food. We can imagine, you know, they were living in first century under Roman oppression, so daily provision of Food is very important for them. It's not like us, 21st century, where our refrigerator is full of food and we throw out so much 
garbage. So Jesus says, there is a food that endures to eternal life. It's uh, in a similar vein where Jesus said to Samaritan woman, whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Jesus is talking about spiritual water. Indeed, the water I give that person will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So you never thirst again. In Beatitude, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the question that I have to ask you, and actually Jesus is asking you, are you like the crowd or a true disciple? The main topic in today's passage is the difference between true and false disciples. True disciples search for the food that lasts in spiritual realms, whereas false disciples will always linger on physical realm. And once Jesus cannot provide what they are looking for, they are going to walk away. Jesus will give this food by offering his own life. Because he is the Messiah who brings God's life through the cross. Only Jesus can give this bread because he's not only the giver of this spiritual bread, he is the bread. The crowd never gives up. They ask again in verse 28, what must we do to do the works God requires? Good question. And this is the question that we need to ask all the time. What must we do to do the work of God? Not many Christians ask this question. Which young ruler asked a similar question? Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Philippian, Philippian jailer also asked the same question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus' answer is always the same. We don't have many answers, but one answer throughout uh, the gospel. Without faith in Jesus, none of our religious activities benefit us. Our primary work is believing in Jesus. And ultimately, it's not a matter of our working for God, but a matter of God's living his life and doing his work through us as we trust Jesus and align ourselves with him. So this is the message for our PWA ladies today. However, we work hard for his church and his people. The primary work is to trust in Jesus and align ourselves with him. The crowd appear to get on board with Jesus but they are still missing the main point. They do not believe in who Jesus is as the giver of eternal life and their Savior. Instead of looking to the giver, they only look to the gift and their own enjoyment. Likewise, it is so easy to lose sight today, even in the midst of trying to please God, even in the midst of working hard for Him, we lose our trust in God's sovereignty and graciousness. So Jesus is right to the point in verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. We need to trust in Jesus no matter what. We need to align ourselves to Him. Jesus doesn't align himself to us. Everything the crowd has said and done has failed to focus on the central figure, Jesus himself. Whatever we do, whatever we say, we have to focus ourselves on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Whatever happened, however hard the devil tries to distract you, focus on Jesus. Desire Him, seek Him, trust Him, and obey Him. 
It is not many works that God requires, but one work, which is to believe, to trust in Jesus as the one sent from God. When it is really hard to trust in Him, still do, because that's your primary work. God's amazing patience and grace is shown in how He is dealing with this crowd and with us who are just like this crowd. Nicodemus had misunderstanding and turned his back on Jesus. Samaritan women had misunderstanding of worship. The paralyzed man had misunderstanding. Now this crowd has misunderstanding. We have our misunderstanding today. Jesus doesn't satisfy our need. God doesn't meet our need. We are also very dull at times. We too can have stiff necks and hardened hearts. Many Christians and many of us are just like this crowd. We need God's help to understand who Jesus is, who truly Jesus is, and what he offers us. Jesus is the bread, superior to the bread that was provided for Israel in the desert. But they still believe that Moses was the one sent by God. So they request additional miraculous signs. Verse 30. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Because Moses gave us manna. The crowd is willing to entertain themselves like Pharaoh did. Remember, in the course of Exodus, there were ten miraculous signs. But over and over and over and over and over again, Pharaoh hardened his heart and asked for another miraculous sign. The Samaritan woman finally believed that Jesus was bigger than Jacob, her ancestor. The crowd clearly saw Jesus' miracles and professed him as the prophet in verse 14. Surely, this is the prophet sent by God. So at that time, they trusted, kind of trusted Jesus as the Messiah. They even tried to make him their king, verse 15. But now, that's something of the past, something of yesterday. So Jesus corrects their understanding again. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. The one who gave them bread was not Moses, but my Father. And it is not the past event only, but the present one. Jesus is giving them the bread that does not spoil. Jesus is far more than the giver of the bread, like Moses was. He is the bread himself. Jesus is the key. The crowd wanted to have another supply of the bread. But Jesus says, I am the bread. Once again, they realize that Jesus cannot satisfy their needs because they are only interested in physical bread. They become not interested any longer. Verse 41, at this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Give us Coca-Cola, give us steak, give us pasta, give us food. We are hungry. It's a brand new day. We need to get another feed. But Jesus keeps saying, I'm the bread. So they grumbled and walked away. We are so much like that in our daily life. Father, give us this and that. And when God says, look to me, trust me, we walk away, we lose our heart. The Samaritan woman reacted differently with faith. Surely, this is the Messiah. 
come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So Samaritan woman reacted with faith. But when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, verse 35, and Jesus declared, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So brothers and sisters, and especially our sisters of PWA this morning, in order for us to have eternal life and continue to live, we need to have food. Food is so important part of our life. But we need the food that lasts forever. And that spiritual food is given to us by nobody but Jesus himself. True meaning of feeding the 5,000. It was a sign of who Jesus is. The source of life and the giver of life. And those who trust in him will hunger no more. He is superior than Moses. Only Jesus can satisfy our needs. And what is required of us is that we come to him and put our trust in him no matter what. We align ourselves to him. Just come and look for him. And you need to believe in him with true faith. And you will never walk away from him. But trust him as your savior and giver of eternal life. Let us bow and pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you again, Father, for reminding us that it's so easy to say that we are your disciple. We trust you. And yet it's another thing to actually trust in you. And for that, we need the help of the Holy Spirit once again so that we will react with faith, that our lives will truly be transformed, that we align ourselves to you. Thank you, Father, that in mercy and grace, Jesus was given as the bread of life, dying for us. And for our sake, he became the curse of the law. May you who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ that we will never be like the crowd who walks away from the bread of life. We give you the praise for what you're going to do in our church and our lives because of the word today. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.